The cares of family. Some say the word Odredek is of Slavonic origin and try to account for it on that basis. Others, again, believe it to be of German origin, only influenced by Slavonic. The uncertainty of both interpretations allows one to assume with justice that neither is accurate, especially as neither of them provides an intelligent meaning of the word. No one, of course, would occupy himself with such studies if there were not a creature called Odredek. At first glance, it looks like a flat, star-shaped spool for thread. <laughs> and indeed, it does seem to have thread wound upon it. To be sure, they are only old, broken-off bits of thread, knotted and tangled together, of the most varied sorts and colors. But it is not only a spool, for a small wooden crossbar sticks out of the middle of the star, and another small rod is joined to that at a right angle. By means of this latter rod on one side, and one of the points of the star on the other, the whole thing can stand upright, as if on two legs. One is tempted to believe that the creature once had some sort of intelligible shape, and is now only a broken down remnant. Yet this does not seem to be the case. At least, there is no sign of it. Nowhere is there an unfinished or unbroken surface to suggest anything of the kind. The whole thing looks senseless enough but in its own way, perfectly finished. In any case, closer scrutiny is impossible, since Odredek is extraordinarily nimble and can never be laid hold of. He looks by turns in the garret, the stairway, the lobbies, the entry hall. Often, for months on end, he is not to be seen. Then, he has presumably moved into other houses. But he always comes faithfully back to our house again. <laughs> Many a time when you go out of the door, and he happens just to be leaning directly beneath you, against the banisters, you feel inclined to speak to him. Of course, you put no difficult questions to him. You treat him, he is so diminutive that you cannot help it, rather like a child. Well, what's your name? He asks. <laughs> <laughs> Odredek, he says. And where do you live? You know, fix the boat. He says and laughs, but it is only the kind of laughter that has no lungs behind it. It sounds rather like the rustling of fallen leaves, and that is usually the end of the conversation. Even these answers are not always forthcoming. Often he stays mute for a long time, as wooden as his appearance. I ask myself, to no purpose, what is likely to happen to him? Can he possibly die? Anything that dies has some kind of aim in life some kind of activity, which is worn out. But that does not apply to Odredek. Am I supposed to, then, uh, uh, am, I, am I to suppose, then, that he will always be rolling down the stairs, with ends of thread trailing after him, right before the feet of my children, and my children's children? He does no harm to anyone that one can see. But the idea that he is likely to survive me, I find almost painful. <laughs> well, I think the first thing we can know, it seems to me, uh, one question is how do we, how do we begin to read this? And um, it seems to me that the first paragraph opens as if it were an academic discourse, mm -hmm. um, a study in um, etymology. Some say the word Odra that is of Slavonic origin. And we, we now know, um, after having read several pieces by Kafka, that there's a lot of some say, right? The priest mm -hmm. said that, and like a wise man says. In other words, there are sort of unknown and unverifiable authorities who make certain kinds of claims. Um, I once was given a rather long essay on Slavonic and Odredek and various interpretations, and I, I tried to imagine various meanings that might, uh, it might have, and then I decided that I was kind of heading down the wrong road. Um, and if you want to talk about that, we can. Um, but I think what's important for the story 
is that um, there's a dispute over how to account for the word. Uh, some say German, some say Slavonic. We you know that Kafka himself uh, spoke Czech at home, he wrote in German, he, his, um, his insurance job was mainly in German. Um, uh, so mixed, mixed languages, they are mixed origins. Um, the uncertainty of both interpretations allows one to assume with justice that neither is accurate, indeed, especially as neither of them provides an intelligent meaning of the word. So at least at the beginning, we seem to be dealing only with a word. Is there an intelligent meaning for this word? Seems like there's dispute, um, conflicting interpretations, neither one particularly well grounded. Um, but then it turns out, well, the only reason we're interested in the word is because there's a creature called Odrudek. Um, and then we get another problem, uh, another problem of how, how to make intelligent meaning out of this creature. Um, and by calling it a creature, of course, he, Kafka doesn't let us know whether this is human or not human. So. So a, a creature that is that has a name but seems not to to take the form of a human, although um, it turns out there are some features of this Odrudek that are surely reminiscent of humanness. Um, so then comes this extraordinary uh, description of what this um, what this creature looks like, and and even though we might expect from the word creature that it would be a living thing, it seems more or less to be a set of objects um, cobbled together in an unwieldy and slightly unintelligible way. And people have tried to draw under a deck. Um, I've asked my undergraduates to draw under a deck, and most people find that it doesn't hold together as a geometrical form yeah. Um, or as something that might um, actually uh, be able to stand with any with any gravity or solidity. Um, you know, some of you actually know some things about architecture. We just suggest to you that this is a kind of an assault on all the various laws that that govern both the architecture of things and the composition of human and non-human creatures. I believe somebody did make an other deck. Do you want to show it? <laughs> it was a collaboration between Well, I think this is the moment. particular strand of thing, right? Looks like it should be made for thread. Well, and in fact, there is some thread. Well, it's not exactly thread. It's bits and pieces of thread. Okay. And Josephine the Singer or the Mouse Folk, for those of you who haven't read it, which is very often considered to be Kafka's um, kind of prescient critique of, um, of nationalism, if not fascism, there is a... Um, there's a lot of talk about Josephine who sings and in her singing has the capacity to bring together the nation. Mm -hmm. Everybody gathers around and they, um, they recognize in her singing the essence of the nation, 
and they were mesmerized by the singing. Well, maybe she doesn't sing, the second paragraph starts. Maybe it's more like a kind of piping. And then the next paragraph, it turns out, well, maybe she doesn't pipe. Maybe it's a kind of squeaking. <laughs> and then it turns out that no one has ever actually seen Josephine, mm -hmm. and no one has ever actually heard her, even though they continue to believe that her singing unifies the nation like no other thing. Okay. It's, it's um, not unlike Borges's Deutsches Requiem, if you know that, which is also, I think, a nice um, anti-fascist piece of fiction. However, this moment of, the, is it what it seems, well, it seems to be this one thing, and then it turns out upon closer inspection that it's not quite what it seems. Um, and what's interesting about these broken off bits of thread, not if you tangle together, right, so a spool, you think you pull the thread off the spool, that's what a spool is for, to hold the thread together in a more or less manageable way so that you can pull it off as needed. But here it's bits and pieces, so already a challenge to intelligibility. Can't really pull those off. And they're various, various sorts and colors. So multicolored bits and pieces of what was formerly thread. And then it turns out it's not only a spool. <laughs> it's not only a spool. It was a spool. Well, I called it a spool, but actually upon close inspection or with qualification, it's not only a spool. For a small wooden crossbar sticks out of the middle of the star. Oh yeah, let's go back to the star. A star-shaped spool? Hard to imagine the, any thread going on a star-shaped item, but let's say the star is at the center of this, of this creature, flat, um, and it turns out there's a wooden crossbar that sticks out of the middle of the star. And I can't help wondering whether we have something like, forgive me, a Star of David with a crucifixion coming out of it, <laughs> another little Judeo-Christian amalgam, right, <laughs> from our friend Kafka. Um, and another small rod is joined to that at a right angle. <laughs> no, 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 no comment. By means of this ladder rod on one side and one of the points of the star on the other, the whole thing can stand upright, and then the analogy, as if on two legs. Okay. If it's standing upright as if on two legs, it's not a human creature, because human creatures generally have two legs unless someone's half of the legs. Um, so it has a resemblance to a standing creature, really? and it can... Um, and it can stand upright as if on two legs. Now note that the analogy or the simile functions in such a way to both distance the object, Odra deck, ob object, not quite creature yet, called creature, but surely just object in this description, um, to distance it from the human, at the same time to establish um, some relationship of affinity, resemblance, if not reminiscence. Okay. Now, what is tempted to believe that the creature, and I'm still waiting to hear in what sense this is creaturely, once had some sort of intelligible shape and is now only a broken down remnant. Well, let's remember that with the word over deck, we were trying to figure out whether it had an intelligent meaning, right? And the quick academic conclusion of the first paragraph is that there are no good foundations to establish an intelligent meaning for the word. And now there's a question at the beginning of the third paragraph whether this creature once had some sort of intelligible shape. So perhaps in another time uh, it had an intelligible shape. One is tempted to believe. One, it's a kind of speculation. It's, it's a, one, one wants to believe it. One's tempted to believe it. Um, uh, the creature once had some sort of intelligible shape and is now only a broken down remnant, which would surely make the current thing reminiscent of a former state in which it enjoyed some, uh, some intelligibility, some coherence. Yet this does not seem to be the case. 
At least there is no sign of it. So we have a little internal disputation. This voice goes back and forth. It doesn't need two voices exactly. It is, it is um, uh, perhaps like the priest's voice um, already um, disputational. Yet this does not seem to be the case. At least there is no sign of it. Okay, so if it once had an intelligible shape and is now a broken down remnant, there is no sign of its former intelligibility. Okay, no sign. That trace, whatever sign might have existed, is not there. Nowhere is there an unfinished or unbroken surface to suggest anything of the kind. Sadly, I don't have a German with me, and I don't know if someone else does. What? Do you have a German, German by any chance? N no, I have the Spanish from Borges. Oh, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so, that makes perfect sense yeah, to me I, that I'm, Borges would Borges, do this. Borges did this it's in a beautiful. book called uh, The Book of Imaginary Beings. Beings. Mm -hmm. Libro de los Imaginarios. That's beautiful. I, it's that's like, uh, you should, you should uh, use... Um, user manual of uh, fantastic zoology. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Thank you. Um, I hope right. you're the well, we're going to have to just work as we work here because I did not bring the epsilon in which I thought I had brought. But um, in any case, um, because he translated from the German, from, the, from German, not yes, from, of course, yes. So I'm not sure we can really the, the German version. Yes, uh, consult the. Does he give the German as well? I, I will. I will look for it. If you want. Okay. I will try to find it. Nice that we would find the German through the Spanish. Um, well, let's continue for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, nowhere is there an unfinished or unbroken surface. So every surface is finished, something's on it, something's laid over upon it. Um, every surface is broken, so something's, so something's discontinuous with it, to suggest anything of the kind. Right, so if it had had an intelligible shape or once was unbroken, there is nothing on the surface to suggest that. The whole thing looks senseless enough, but in its own way, perfectly finished. Hmm. This is the moment where I wonder whether he's talking about his own. And it, and he says sense, senseless, and he he puts like in, in that is not useful. It's not useful. Something like that, inservible, that okay. you cannot u get useful. Okay. I'm curious about unfinished and finished. How does that work in German? Is is that Consciously and correctly repeated in English, the, the, the one notion of unfinished and complete, the other one finished as in Polish. Let's see if someone they can find this. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay, yeah, this is the problem. Here's of the Family Man is actually it has a very different German title. Um, it's a Hausvater. Hausvater, danke. Hausvater is this. The Hausvater. <laughs> the father of the house. The father of the house. <laughs> And it's interesting that it's called House Fata, because mm -hmm. where is the House Fata? Is, it, is this the House Fata's voice? It, it seems as if there's some paternal kind of voice here. Um, but let's, let's, let's just live with our um, problematic translation for a moment. Um, let's think about in what way it might be, it might appear perfectly finished, even though it looks senseless enough, okay? And it might be useless enough, senseless enough, um, but still finished. Um, and then the question is, what kind of object is this, which is senseless enough, but still finished? In any case, closer scrutiny is impossible, since Oderdeck is extraordinarily nimble and can never be laid hold of. So Oderdeck cannot be grasped, literally. Okay? And this is always interesting in the German because begreifen is both to grasp and to conceptualize. Um, Odrodek is extraordinarily nimble. It can never be laid hold of. So something's darting about with, with movement and speed. 
He works by turns in the garret, the stairway, the lobbies, the entrance hall. He lurks by turns in the garret, the stairway, the lobbies, the entrance hall. So it seems to me that Audre Deck belongs to the house in some way. He seems to at least inhabit the house, perhaps as a kind of ghostly creature. Um, he's not actually named as a son or as, as a family member. Um, but at this moment, when we hear that he lurks by turns in the garret, the stairway, the lobbies, the entrance hall, we're suddenly in, in the presumption that this is a single house. And whoever this narrator is, is living in this house with the red bag. Essentially, they're all provisional spaces, transitional spaces, not where people live or stay usually, right? You don't stay in the entrance. So the provision, they're um, transitional spaces. Not yes, but there's no stay. bedroom. Yeah. There's no bedroom for this creature. Right. Or it's his bedroom, but not for the people. For the people. Well, uh, there may be bedrooms, we don't know. No, no, but I'm, I'm saying that the creature stays in the entrance hall. Yes. Maybe his, his bedroom, but not the bedroom of the presupposed people of the house. The transition is yes. from the from I, human point of view. Yes, mm -hmm. but what I can't tell is whether you think Odre Deck has a bedroom, and you're just saying like the garret might be the bedroom, or whether you're saying Odre Deck does not have a bedroom. We don't know. We don't know. Okay. Often from once on end, he's not to be seen, which is odd. He lives yeah. there, he doesn't live there. Then he has presumably moved into other houses. Right? Which suggests that he doesn't really belong. He disappears. He could he could presumably be in another house. He doesn't have to be in this house. There's no necessary reason for him to be in this house. So whatever way in which Audre Deck inhabits this house is tenuously without fixed abode and without um, uh, without a strict sense of belonging. Okay. Um, and then, you know, the voice kind of goes back in another direction, but he always comes faithfully back to our house again. So what is this fealty? <laughs> what is this fidelity on the, on the part of Odre Deck to this house? Why, why would Odre Deck return faithfully unless there was some kind of belonging? So doesn't belong, belong. Some... some uh, mix of the two. And then it, it seems to change. Many a time when you go out the door, did you find it? Yes, we did. Great. Many a time when you go out the door, is that a do? It's like when one goes out the door? <coughs> okay, when one goes out the door, and he happens just to be leaning directly beneath you against the banisters, you feel inclined to speak to him. <laughs> he has a gender. He has a gender, this school-like thing, which is nimble, um, can never be laid hold of. So it's self-motoring. It's a self-motoring kind of creature. Belongs, doesn't belong. It's capable of some kind of faithful action, or at least an action that could be interpreted that way. Is the gender indicated in the drama as that is the composition? It would have to be. It would have to be. Um, of course, you put no difficult questions to him. You treat him as so diminutive that you cannot help it. Rather like a child. Okay, so here's another. Here's another comparison, right? Here's another simile. Audra Deck uh, stands uh, as if on two legs sort of like a human, you treat him rather like a child. Resemblance to a child is not quite a child. The simile both establishes Odre Deck as something other than a child, but also establishes resemblance or reminiscence precisely there. Um, well, what's your name, you ask him? And then he actually speaks for the first time, and his first word is Odre Deck. Odradek, he says. An intelligible word. What's your name? An intelligible word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> of unknown origins. Of unknown origins. origins. And 
I mean, obviously, if this is a kind of house fata, or if it's a father of some kind, and says, well, who are you? What's your name? Oh, Dredek, I'm of unknown origins. I'm an unintelligible word of unknown origins. In other words, um, I'm not your son, don't worry. And I don't know where I come from. And I'm nothing other than garbled language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in your house, but don't mind me. <laughs> and where do you live? Right? The question, like, oh, where do you live? Kind of wonderful naivete. Wonderful, again, academic distance, really. And where do you live? Oh, no fixed abode, he says. Well, what is that in the German? Unbestimmter Wohnsitz. Okay. <laughs> um, undetermined. Oh, here's another word. Yeah. Bestimmt. This time. Un unbestimmter Wohnsitz. Un un unknown domicile. Yes. Un undetermined. <laughs> undetermined domicile. Um, and Wohnsitz would technically be what you would officially have from a registration bureau for your address. Yes. Right, so it's a kind of legal term for your house, or wherever you live. Um, no fixed abode, he says, and laughs. And laughs. We have to wonder about that laughter. Avital asked us about the laughter. Um, and what is this laughter? I mean, I laughed. I still laugh. Um, I guess I laugh in part because it sure seems like this creature lives there and might even be a massively disfigured child of some kind um, who's nevertheless speaking to what seems to be a father and saying, oh, I don't live here, I'm in a fixed place, just splitting through. Like one imagines the, the constantly vacating child who's, who offers reassurance to the father that, no, no, I did not come from you and I am not yours. Um, he says, and laughs, but it's only the kind of laughter that has no lungs behind it, right? At which point you wonder, oh, what happened to lungs? How can you laugh without lungs? It has no lungs behind it. As, as if some human organic dimension is missing, is, 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 has fallen away or was never there. Sorry? I just wanted to say, yesterday when we were talking about uh, laughter and speaking of uh, is motivated by the book, talking in the context of fear. And I was thinking a lot of the time, that's often, no, I'm sorry, you were saying I was thinking in the context of smuggling the power or in the context of power. But I was thinking how fear is also motivated. Laughter is also motivated by fear. And so when I'm reading, just thinking up here, when I'm reading this, like, to say that you're going to fix the road and to laugh. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, I mean, it suggests invulnerability. It suggests invulnerability. Yeah, vulnerability. Vulnerability. Yeah. Or anxiety. Yeah. Especially given who he's speaking to. Yeah. What if he said, I live right here with you, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> right? It's the exact opposite, right? It's precisely it comes out. It's like, I don't, don't you know. I don't live here. I don't know what I Well, it's true. He, he escapes. He escapes. He's in the Can't lay hold of him. He's, he's escaping in language, we might say, at such a moment, no fixed abode. Yeah, I was just noting, excuse me, the other thing that came up yesterday. Yeah. I just had a lot of funny things that I thought was really interesting. Yeah. And it was both associated with power and we didn't discuss how it's also associated with fear. With fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Seems plausible that there might be some fear in this laughter. Mm -hmm. And then our narrator, who we should begin to distrust, like what kind of creature is the narrator? You know? It is only the kind of laugh laughter that has no lungs behind it, right? So is this the moment in which, in which this, this creature is perceived by our narrator precisely as not human, or, or having lost lungs, or uncannily being able to laugh without lungs? Right? That would be the moment of the gesture, right? That where, where a hu where a human expression of some kind has lost its traditional supports or has been divorced from it. Um, the gesture of laughing, we might expect to be part of a set of lungs housed in a body, and yet it seems that this body is a spool of thread with, with crosses and, and, and stars and rods, <laughs> bits and pieces colored and very, um, and so, we actually can see something of the um, 
uh, the the separation of the gestural moment from um, from its traditional supports. And then our narrator claims it sounds rather like the rustling of fallen leaves, um, which is a quite amazing statement. A laughter that sounds like the rustling of fallen leaves. It's not a human sound. It's it's something else. It's some um, it's some piece of the landscape. It's this. It's the sound of some ambient landscape. And um, what does it mean if if a once human creature has become makes sounds that are like the rustling of leaves? Something about um, that disarticulation as a landscape, the human form is disarticulated as the sound of fallen leaves, rustling of fallen leaves. But certainly leaves that have fallen, mm -hmm. not leaves on a tree, leaves upon which people trample, or <laughs> leaves that are blown by the wind, but debris, right? The leaves that are finished, that have fallen. And that is usually the end of the conversation, right? Not saying who ends it exactly. But that's as much as uh, as ever gets said. Maybe what is your name and where do you live? Odor, death, no fixed abode. Okay. <laughs> so one way to have a father-son relationship. <laughs> I don't know if Larry would say it's edible or pre-edible, but I got a feeling it might be pretty. Um, even these answers are not always forthcoming. Often he stays mute for a long time, as wooden as his appearance, suggesting, at least in the English, that the muteness is wooden, right? So something wooden happens to language, it becomes mute, in the same way that his appearance is wooden, and the, the, the quality of woodenness seems to transfer between the human form and the linguistic expression. Uh, muteness is the wooden is the wooden form of speech. Uh, Odre deck is a is a wooden form of the human. Um, some petrification is happening. Some woodening. Some solidification of this creature. I asked myself. Okay, here our academic father figure poses a question to himself: What is likely to happen to him? Can he possibly die? Okay, and we could rightfully wonder whether this narrator is concerned for this creature or has a relationship of belonging to this creature. Um, can he possibly die? That is to say, is he a mortal kind of being? Anything that dies has had some kind of aim in life. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that aim is... Um, is it um, Ziel or it Schicksal? It's no. Ziel? Alles, was stirbt, hat vorher eine Art Ziel. Ziel, yeah. Okay, so anything that dies has had some kind of aim in life. Okay, Ziel, goal. Some kind of activity, Tätigkeit, okay. which has worn out. Um, daran hat es sich zerrieben. Zerrieben? Zerrieben. Zerrieben, mm -hmm. which I don't know. Really? It's not even like to oh, rub, rub down. You rub, down. rub down. The tear is like making it extra. Destroyed. Yeah, rubbed out, I think we would say. <laughs> Crushed. 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 Mm. Crushed. But that does not apply to Odre Deck. Oh, and why not? Anything that dies has had some kind of aim in life, some kind of activity which has worn out or been rubbed out, but that does not apply to Odre Deck. So the I, the first person, um, uh, house fatalist creature, says that does not apply to Andrew Deck with some authority. Am I to suppose, and then he asks a question, hmm. which is a funny thing to do, am I to suppose then that he will always be rolling down the stairs, right? If he's not a creature with an aim, how can he die? Because all living creatures have an aim. Could this creature even die? We think of, he's thinking of death as something that follows the accomplishment of an aim. Right? Life is structured by goal. But if a life is not structured by a goal, how is it possible that this creature can die? 
And then it seems to me with some, uh, what I imagine to be despair or, um, um, what is the word in English? Um, with some um, consternation, he, um, he, write, he says, I, am I to suppose then that he will always be rolling down the stairs? Emma, no? Is it Emma? No, there's nothing. No, Sollte er also einstmals etwa noch vor den Füßen meine Kinder und Kinder Kinder? Okay. Alles, was stirbt, hat vorher eine Art Ziel, eine Art Tätigkeit gehabt und daran hat es sich zerrieben. Das trifft bei Otterdeck nicht zu. Okay, and then? Sollte er also einstmals etwa noch vor den Füßen meine Kinder und Kindeskinder mit nachschleitenden Zirnfaden die Treppe hinunterkommen, er schadet ja auch ein Barimandin. So it's einstmals. Einstmals. That's a very interesting use of einstmals. Because um, it's not just one, one time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, it's because if he's saying, mm -hmm. am I to suppose with threads trailing after him, um, that he will always be rolling down, that he will be rolling down the stairs, einstmals, almost like for the first time, each time, is the way I would actually read it. For the first time, each time, right before the feet of my children and my children's children. In other words, he's imagining that this rolling is going to continue through generations. Mm -hmm. And, um, but if you say einstmals, <coughs> it seems like you're saying, one time, yeah. but actually it would be time and again, or, uh, uh, sorry? It has this really strange subtlety of being exactly that, like in one, you know, determined time, but also at the same time, a past time. It can also mean in former times, or once upon a time. I see. So it's einstmals. So, so once upon a time, that's how we, einstmals war der, is that, is that how we start? Einstmals etwa noch, uh, do we start fairy tales with einstmals? No, nee, uh, um, no, it's not einstmals. It's a time in this time. It's before, right? In former times. This, like this is a, I use a good dictionary here and I trust it a lot. And it says that you, it can be once, but it can also mean in former times or formerly. So it's, it has like a potential present as well as a past ending. Which is okay. Great. So, so <laughs> let us assume that there's a very complex temporality that's being asserted here in the present, but also in the past, but also by virtue of the context in the future, mm -hmm. right? So it's, so it's actually an ungrammatical use. It's an ungrammatical use of Einstein's to talk about something that formerly was rolling, rolls still, and will roll. Um, and, and is he supposed to imagine this uh, rolling down uh, the stairs with these ends of threads trailing after him, all this unintelligible, these unintelligible bits and pieces before the feet of his children and my children's children. In other words, there's a generational nightmare here. Okay. There are, apparently, creatures who are his children and he's imagining, or perhaps they already exist, those who are his children's children. But Odredek is something else, and Odredek traverses that generational line as a nightmare, right? One who will never die, in fact, is not subject to the logic of generation, because has no aim in life, and you can only die if you have an aim in life, and apparently if it's realized, I think it's what I'm gathering. But um, this is a moment in which uh, the narrator speaks to whom? Am I to suppose? This is an open-ended question, right? Is it, to, is it to God? Is it to anyone? Is it to everyone? Am I to suppose this, that he will continue to do this, and that he will be rolling down the stairs right before the feet of my children, right? like a child would roll down the stairs before the feet of other children, but 
in this way, he's, he's something like a specter of a child or a specter of an intelligible creature that rolls before the feet of his children and his children's children, kind of haunting, um, kind of haunting in advance, some, some ghost or ghost-like or incomprehensible creature that um, is paving the way. And also, it seems to me that if he's always rolling, he's never really at the top of the stairs and he's really never at the bottom of the stairs. Mm -hmm. In other words, he doesn't go from one, he doesn't descend from the top to the bottom, he's just always rolling. And that goes along with the idea that he has no aim, right? He's not going from one place to another. He's actually in perpetual rolling. So if, if we can read it that way, it seems like it's a perpetual present tense which, which comes to no end, um, has no depth and has no aim and does not get to the bottom of the stairs. And then an odd line, he does no harm to anyone that one can see. He does no harm to anyone that one can see. I wonder uh, if one cannot see the harm that he does, or one cannot see the one to whom harm is done. He does no harm to anyone that one can see. I mean, if, if it's that um, he does no harm to anyone that one can see, and one cannot see Odradek as a one, right, we've got the problem with the one here, as an individual, as a person, as a human, right, then he may do harm to himself, but that's not visible because Odradek is not one whom one can see. In the Spanish you can omit the he, she, him, yes. so you don't use anything. I see. So you can just say that. He does no harm. Yeah, you, you don't say he or it or she. You can use nothing. nothing so. Okay. And then the final, but the idea that he's likely to survive me is Ubalé. The idea that he's likely and that is Vashani. The Vorstellung, that he nicht auch noch überleben sollte. I see. <laughs> also still. Also mm -hmm. still. Auch noch. That also still will, will survive me. So that what's interesting about the still, the not, mm -hmm. is um, uh, even though he is not a child of mine, he's it's still mm -hmm. he's still likely to survive me. In other words, he's still in some generational relation to me. Um, and that idea, I find almost painful. Why not just painful? Hm. What is the almost painful? The very, the very es, ist, es ist mir eine fast schmerzliche, fast die, schmerzliche. schmerzliche Vorstellung. Okay, Vorstellung, Representation. Um, I know that it's almost painful. Yes. No, it's painful. He just suspects it might be painful. Uh -huh. <laughs> You know, for me, the auch noch here is also in relation to, in the previous sentence where he's saying this, you know, the temporality of this Einstmal not being clear exactly how far back into the past it exceeds and how far back into the future, and then he's emphasizing, and on top of that, still, yeah. still. he's even going to survive, like, past my life. Yes. <laughs> yes. He has no ability. The entire thing seems to be so spiked with an it's true, but it turns out that maybe the, the narrator knows a little bit more than he lets on at the beginning, and as the, as the story unfolds, we are at least able to see that there's some ambiguity about, about what the, the narrator, Haus Vater, might know. And his, his academic distance seems to collapse a little bit, especially at the, at the end. Yeah, okay. I don't know that he's not at all. It's lack of certainty. Lack of certainty. Okay. Anybody else have a comment about how this sounds? Yeah, please. Okay. No, no, uh, 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 make, make a comment about no, how this sounds. I was thinking in the moment that I think I can interpret behind this poem by Zelan. I think I can interpret it. I think 
to be kind of, I mean, I was thinking like if it's broken, is it written or araka? Yes. And I think there are elements to think uh, that before, um, he said since the beginning, uh, no one, of course, right? With occupying some such studies, there was not a creature called Odalek. But it starts saying that it's a name. Yes. So I think it is a name. I mean, Odalek. I mean, you know? mm. Okay, so it's a name. And I think a little bit more about Salam. I mean, okay. Salam in 60 quoted the, uh, 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 probably, uh, uh, not probably, certainly, he knew Kafka the reality. Yes. But in the 60, he quotes uh, Kafka saying, uh, when he was saying Kafka. And in 58, he was his, I mean, I think there are many references, and he said it's a word. It looks to me like a. Like a word. Ceylon says it's a word. Well, there's a poem about uh, a wooden star, uh, and he says it is a word. I would say. I see. Do, do we have that poem? Yeah. Do you, yeah. you want to show it to people? It's in German. <laughs> we'll, we'll help. We'll help. <laughs> we'll do our best. Um, what what should I do? I don't know. Did you want to tell us about this poem? Me? Uh uh. What's it called in German? Is that a title? Um, I'm Holstein. I'm going to do it again. Is it what I can maybe do it next? If you want. I mean, tell <laughs> I'm sure it's not true. So I'm Holstein. I'm Holstein. Blau, äh, aus kleinen Rauten gebaut. Heute von den Jüngsten unsere Hände. Das Wort, während du sagst, auf der Fels, der Blick wieder die Windgarde sucht. Ein Stern, für ihn, für den Stern in die Nacht, in meine, in meine. Und ich sage, dass ich so, ich wollte das Poem, wenn ich mean, hier die Illumination habe, zu sehen, das Poem, zu äh, reden, weil äh, sie äh, als Child äh, playing mit. Äh, with the blocks. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it gives you, I mean, he quoted the, he quoted the, uh, we are talking about distortion, and, and he, he quoted the, uh, Benjamin said just a few lines yes. after the other day. When yes. Benjamin talked about distortion, other day, and I don't trust you with him. Yes. So, okay. All right, so what do people make of this? Uh, related with, with the other thing we were reading about yeah. the law. About before the law? Yeah, before the law. Uh, it, if, if this Odradek could be like a kind of instrument that cannot be instrumentalized, well, it's, it says, yeah. yeah, like, because the law, what, yeah. No, continue, then I will find out why I, I, I thought about this before. Um, okay. Yeah, please. I, I lo I'm lost. Okay. But I, I, I will find out what I was going to say. So, um, so um, there, are, there are two different moments where we're doing a response to... Um, to Kafka, one of them is an essay on Kafka that you find in his, his book called Prisms. Um, and the other really is um, in his letters to, to Benjamin. Um, but in his little essay that's in Prisms, he, he talks about um, Odudek as salvational. He uses this word salvational, like, uh, as if he's, that Odudek is a saving figure. And um, I guess the question, one question we might have is, in, in what way? Right, Odrideck is useless without aim, perpetual. Um, but we might say um, that um, Odrideck became an important figure for Benjamin and Adorno, um, especially because it's, it seems to give some um, um, some form to the, the problem of, of human figures that have become uh, transformed into objects, um, inscrutable, uh, aimless, um, 
who resemble or recall a former intelligibility, um, but who also escape the logic of instrumentality. And you'll remember that the critique of instrumental reason was at the heart of um, the dialectic of enlightenment, right? Adorno and Aaron Parkland, um, as they were trying to write about new structures of domination in the late 40s and 50s, they wanted to say um, very clearly that um, we couldn't just look at capitalist modes of exploitation and domination. Um, as classical Marxists have done, but we also needed to understand that there are new regimes of rationality that have emerged, um, and the mo most problematic of one is, is instrumentality, okay? That everyone should be instrumentalized for a purpose, and that something only has value to the extent that it has an instrumental purpose. Some of this thinking has, I think, come back in the in more recent work on neoliberalism, and some of you are actually experiencing this if you're part of higher education institutions <laughs> in Europe or in the United States or in Australia, um, uh, um, because um, uh, many of us are suddenly asked, what's the what's the use of the humanities, or what's the use of knowing Greek, or What's the use of a poetry class, or you know, mm -hmm. can we calculate the usefulness of uh, Swahili, uh, which has been kind of dropped from the Berkeley language courses? Um, and many departments now are involved in thinking about knowledge regimes in terms of whether or not they can um, comply with standards. Uh, that demand a show of utility. Right. So um, if, let's say, you had a critical theory program whose premise it was to call into question the primacy and distor distorting effects of instrumental reason, <laughs> and, you wanted, <laughs> and you wanted to get funding for such a program, <laughs> you would have to somehow figure out like how to make it sound useful unless you found a really rich leftist. <laughs> yeah. Right? The only way around the oh, utility yes. standards that are that have now become rationality itself, like not just like one mode of rationality, which is what I don't know and quote kind of thought, but but really rationality itself um, uh, is is to do an end run. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, alongside instrumental rationality, this is something I wish I would have brought up earlier. Also, is uh, is uh, Marcuse mm -hmm. who talks about it's not uh, who also talks about the defeated logic of protest. Yes. Right. So it's not just a matter. I mean, don't get me wrong. Instrumental rationality is incredibly yes. important, but also the one-dimensional rationality. One dimensional and that man. It's no for yeah. It's no more. Yes. Rationality. If you don't feel like getting all the way through dialectic and like exactly. <laughs> To understand briefly what the critique of instrumental reason is, Marcuse's no, one dimensional no, man is a fine place to go. Yeah. It's a super fine place to go. But, okay, so why would Adorno have been so drawn to Audra Deck and surely Benjamin, too, as you could see in what you read? Um, and it's not that Audra Deck is a model for the future, like, oh, let's. Yeah, let's all become Ojo <laughs> right? Like, let's follow Ojo let's, let's, get, you know, let's go, you know, protest budget cuts in the European Union, and we're going to have Ojo Deck in the front. Although, I have to say, there were those book shields. I don't know if you saw the book shields yeah. in book shields. Do you know what those are? Yeah. Okay, so in London and Rome, at least I saw book shields where people are are on the street in mass holding up titles of books mm -hmm. um, um, claiming they have a right to read this and making a demand to be able to read these works and realizing that the reading of these works would never be justified by the, the new standards of excellence and the new um, uh, measures of utility. And among them, um, among them was, was Adorno, 
right? There's, mm -hmm. there's a dialect of enlightenment out there, right? Kant's critique of pure reason, and I have to admit, gender trouble is there. Uh, uh. Is there <laughs> 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 and, and, and in a way, it's like saying, yes, that's right, there's, there's, you can't use these books to maximize profits, you can't use these books to um, immediately accomplish aims that would could be tabulated according to various um, uh, point systems of excellence. Um, that what is critical, um, what is critical is actually about asking about how such norms of rationality emerge, what function they serve, and what they foreclose, <coughs> right? What they make impossible, right? So, so what is Odradek? Odradek is. It, Oderdeck's useless. I mean, unemployed, basically, very <laughs> profoundly unemployed. Um, you know, it's, it's a good for nothing. A good for nothing, very good. Yes. Um, uh, I okay. do you say in Spanish? Bueno para nada. I was going to say that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think we can skip the relationship between the artist who is um, ideologically or Beyond escaping instrumentality, and I think of the Champ who always said about how you know I never worked, I never had to work, or you know, he doesn't claim to be bourgeois, yes, but he makes it very clear that he never worked to as a living. So, really, that work, I, work I think is something that's repugnant, and um, this whole idea of escaping instrumentality is like something that that would be sort of idea of an artist. Well, but could we distinguish between a kind of noblesse oblige? Like, I'm not going to, like, I have to stay home and work. I'm too delicate, and luckily I've got people who support me. I, I mean, additional is also, I think, it's quite a process, perhaps. But I don't think of it in those terms. I think, I mean, OJ could be an artist. Well, um... Um, uh, or, 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 or without our church. Well, that's like I mean, not because it is an artist without worship, it will be the doorkeeper or something like that. Well, there's so many things that you know, it's not ours, but I think that there, when we just, you know, we talk about escaping instrumentality, I think there's something. It's true, but what I want to suggest is that. There are different ways of arguing for the the uselessness of art or the non instrumental value of art, mm -hmm. and some of them depend on uh, they they depend on philanthropy or art institutions or um, others who are employed or money of that kind. I think that what we actually see in Odo Deck is um, is something slightly different because. The the so the, the world of work and family is here, mm -hmm. um, in the sense of there's a presumption that humans have an aim, and that they seek to realize it, mm -hmm. and there's a presumption of family, of household, and even of generation. So this creature emerges in the interstices of the family, and in and fails to conform to the. Again. Yes, but but the thing is, is that it, it would be very hard to find an equivalent in something like Duchamp, because the problem is that um, if, let's say, you want to make an argument for abstract expressionism, or you want to make an argument for non-referential art, or art that can't be used in some way, it doesn't mean that it's entering into the household or the work ethic in a critical way. In other words, this strikes me as a um, as a uselessness that's actually produced out of these forms of institutions and which lives among them as its excess and as its monstrosity. And I'm not sure we can hold all that together with a Rothko. I love Rothko. Don't get me wrong. A Rothko is very different than a and I wonder, so maybe it's neither the Duchamp nor the urinal, but if the Duchamp became a urinal or resembled a urinal in a objectified form, then it would be more like that. Yeah, because the communication, <coughs> objectification, I think. Yeah. But, okay, where, where is it, I think? I think we, we lose the... Um, but it will be the same with, with books or with 
philosophers, I mean, because philosoph philosophers can be, in a way, useful because they are inserting a kind of system of professors. Simple you know what I mean? Yes, well, of with course. Art, with art, it, they, it could, they, they could be uh, business in art or something, yeah. and, but there is something that in the essence of art that could be like... Okay. That, no. well, okay. Like poetry let's, or something? Let's, let's not. I'm trying, I'm trying to think about, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think about how not to go down this particular path. Maybe there's just a way of acknowledging that there are various ways of launching an anti instrumental aesthetic practice. Okay? And, and we'll just like leave it there. My only worry is that I'm afraid of losing the specificity of this one, which is not to say I don't want to put down another one, but I'm just. I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to understand it because, I mean, the other point is, you know, Oderdeck, um this is also a, a piece of writing. Um, it's, a, it's a short story, we might say, um, uh, or, a, or a short tale of some kind. And we approach it with the question, can we use this? Is it of use to us? And it seems to me that there's a difference between asking the question of how we can use it, instrumentalize it, and a part, and the question of what it opens up in terms of a possible, and I would say just a critique, but also um, uh, another notion of of the future, or another notion of time. Hmm. Because I think one of the things that's happening in most of the readings here um, that we've done is we've been looking at um, um, uh, funny, I want to say uh, interventions in established temporal regimes in order to open up a different kind of um, futurity or a different kind of temporality or to reclaim or allow back in a certain kind of history that has either been foreclosed or is at jeopardy for falling into oblivion. Uh, it seems like that's that's one thing we've, we've seen in the Benjamin Kafka nexus. And um, so one could say, well, isn't that useful to open up another temporality? And, and I want to know. I want to know whether usefulness is enough. Is a strong enough term for that? In other words, um, uh, Benjamin talks about revolutionary action, um, which is big, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, or the creation of a new calendar, um, or fighting for the history of the oppressed. And if we go back to this this last line, um, which I think interested you, the fact that Oderdeck is likely to survive this man, he finds almost painful, which means he doesn't quite find it painful. Which and what is unpainful about that survival? What's actually even minimally hopeful <laughs> about that survival? It reminds me of the, that kind of strange final moment in um, in the judgment, like where it certainly looks like a suicidal drop, and yet there's some kind of survival, survival or persistence in the writing there. Mm -hmm. And let's also remember that Kafka is constantly, I mean, I think this as a biography is useful just to remind us, Kafka's constantly fighting with his father. Mm -hmm. What? His father's quite a bit of uses for writing. Hmm. What use is that for? Mm -hmm. kind of your useless activity. You sit all day long in your room with that useless activity. Right? So, is there is there a, a peculiar uh, vanishing, not fully embodied form of survival in writing? <laughs> Um, um, in, in, in not conforming to the instrumental human form, 
and in this creation, which doesn't hold together in the usual ways, yeah. um, is a queer creation. I mean, this is a this is queer. <laughs> I would say this is <coughs> it's very really queer. If you want to know what queer is, <laughs> <laughs> um, super queer, super cyborg queer. You know, really at the cutting edge. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I feel pretty provoked by the last line. I, I, I forget at what point it, it connected with what you were just saying. But yes. I did have a, there's something, if we imagine a human world, uh, it, it, uh, you're invoking queer as starting out, but if we're invoking a human world, however queer this object is or this thing is, is, is there something no, it, inordinately queer about a person in the human world being pained by the idea that not only will this creature outlive him, but will live his children and grandchildren. I mean, the fondest wish of a parent is to be succeeded by their children in, in all senses, to outlive. Well, this and is and this has been outliving the best. Yeah. It, it's kind of upside down. There is a kind of inversion. Um, it might be painful to think that it, it, the, the, the uh, older that will outlive the descendants. But why would it be painful to, to think that all your death about your view if you have descendants? That this, there's a strange inversion there. Yes, but, but look, we've got a so-called father figure who's, who hasn't exactly um, avowed over death as a child. But that's my point. He's, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's a necessary provocation between his supposed children and older death. And he's pained by the idea that older death will outlive this human family. There's an inversion there, or, or there's 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 a, a strongly suggested comparison. And if he's if he's a human father that one would imagine in, in general form outline, why is he pained by this? If it's a child of his, he shouldn't be pained by outliving. But if it's compared to the, his children, there's a strange inversion there. It is true. Look, is there is it possible? that the reason he's almost pained, but not quite pained, mm -hmm. um, suggesting that he's a little bit unpained, or maybe even possibly mm -hmm. a bit happy, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is that this, this progeny, if it is progeny, is not replicating him. It's not his replication, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Something else has happened here. Mm -hmm. The system is not replicating itself in the way it's supposed to, the father, the child, the useful citizen. There's a, there's been a there's been a derailing of the process of replication, and maybe he wishes at some level for this progeny, non-progeny, to have another form or another possibility. So now you're going back to Kafka's own father and to Gregor Sansa's father. Well, no, because they're referencing you, aren't you? Not really. No, I mean I. I hear that echo. Well, I'm sure they are echoed. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they are echoed. Um, there's no doubt about it. We've got lots of fathers going on here. Um, there's a lot of things. Yes, it's absolutely true. But what I'm wondering is if there isn't a kind of specific mm, furtive pleasure in imagining mm -hmm. that yes, the I son know. will escape the fate of the father and that the mm -hmm. son will fail to replicate the father's life. But you are not going to be stuck like me as this weird academic voice, house father. Right. thinking about the generations. So if I can try to agree with you and refer back to, to Kafka himself. To some extent, so at one point, he's referencing the father, but at another point, he's talking about himself. I mean, this is supposed the, 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 the empirical author, Franz Kafka, who is by writing useless things, hopes to not replicate his father's instrumental life. Well, that's for sure. That's for damn sure. Yeah. Um, there's no question about that. I'm just thinking of that, that kind of hidden pleasure that you're hinting at. Yes, I mean, I'm, just, I'm just thinking, um, uh, okay, um, good enough. Good enough. Um, can we talk for a moment about commodity fetishism? But, but let's, let's I just want to ask about the, yeah. the Spielschule. Yes. Which is a feminine word, and it's a feminine object. Yes, it belongs 
So that's where's the mother in here? Oh, where's the mother? We're always yeah. asking. <laughs> we're yeah. asking to her. I mean, yeah. This is a something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a strange thing. It's also a very common object. This yes. flat. Um, <laughs> My mother has these yes, okay. star-shaped so little fetish, thing. so a little kind of yes. maternal fetish object. I don't know, mm -hmm. but it also has, I mean, thread, something that carries thread. Right, it's yeah. also thread, something in the story thing, or Yes, the threads of the story the don't quite go together, mm -hmm. but maybe there is some both maternal fetish thing, but also there's a, there's a little theological problem in the story, not just with the star and the cross, on the cobble together, but in this kind of strange temporality that Audre Deck appears to occupy, which seems not exactly to um, conclude in death and to be a kind of um, endless spinning, rolling, um, that has its own. Um, I even want to say kind of shadowy infinity to it, right? It's almost as if some some strange infinity opens up in and through this this creature who will be rolling throughout all time, right? The, the generations are coming and going, but this this queer figure who's outside of generational life seems to open up a different temporality, one one who one, one who whose life is not bounded by ideas of work or generation or or a household. So if you if you if if Adorno says there's something salvational here, what's he saying? He said there's there's this is Audre Deck permits us to think the outside of these systems that are replicating themselves all the time in ways that are um, that are involved fundamentally in the commodification of human relations, in the reification of the human form, um, in the, um, the dispossession of human um, attributes like laughter from their embodied spaces and conditions. Um, in other words, we, we have a, a figure of of extreme alienation, commodification, reification in Odra Deck, um, which condenses instrumental reason, uh, uh, the normativity of the family and its reproduction, um, commodity fetishism, which personifies objects and reifies humans, right? That's its inverse movement. Seems like both are going on here. So we have a very dense moment, a dense critical moment in relationship to capitalism, family, household, sexual normativity even. Um, and you know, I, 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 I think that's one reason why Audre Deck has become so, so important for a certain uh, kind of critical Marxist um, literary aesthetic criticism um, because, not because it holds out a model or an ideal, but because it smashes them. <laughs> or, it sh or it shows what the debris is. And in a way, you remember we talked at least with, with Benjamin, we, we talked about the angel of history, the blown backward, and that tower of debris rising. In some ways, and we asked whether the debris could be animated yes. And whether Benjamin was looking for certain kinds of sparks or animation mm -hmm. in the debris, and that there's some kind of divinity or revolutionary full, chance full in there. Ethics. In full a way, Audre Deck is an animated moment of debris, made of debris, mm -hmm. cobbled out of debris, mm -hmm. is the debris of the household, and yet speaks somehow a bit, Caput. moves, moves. Caput. Caput. Kaput, like, yeah, broken, yeah, yeah. doesn't function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't function. Uh, and it's not functionalist. It yeah. cannot, be, cannot be assimilated to any functionalist ontology. Yeah. Right? Doesn't function. Mm -hmm. But is nimble, can't quite be grasped. Um, but even still has some laughter. Still has some laughter. 
Sorry? Even in the genealogy of uh, this idea of parents and everything that it says, uh, it's like an acceptance of that every time there is something that is kaput and is it's the gate to get out of. Or, uh, yeah. Like even in, in these kind of relations. And yeah. So th this this Adratic uh, in the in the family or in everywhere uh -huh. is like the is like the, the kaput thing in every. You know, even it's in genetics, I mean, every, something every, that, yeah, yeah there's a, there's a, you have a, pa a there's father, a, a mother, or, yeah. or you have kids, and they, yes. they, they have nothing to do with you, you know. Yes, but the only thing we need to be careful of yeah. is there's a way of talking about the dysfunctional, which is always in relation to the functional. Mm -hmm. And where the dysfunctional has to be transformed into the functional, oh, yeah, no, it's or not through that. adaptation, but this yeah. would be, in some ways, the dysfunction that will never adapt. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the resistance to adaptation. Yeah. And somebody asked me, you know, what do like you think the about the Lacanian mm -hmm. real? The Lacanian real is the resistance to adaptation. Right? It can mm -hmm. creep. You know, mm -hmm. but so, Audrey Deck could be. You know, if you really wanted to go that way, you could. But I think there are other ways of talking about resistance to adaptation. I'm going to take your question, I think, after the break. It's yeah. just a clarifying okay. question. It's really brief. Yeah, yeah. Just in terms of reification, I know I went to the washroom, and I'm very sorry. I, I, if you were oh, Twitter, no, 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 I apologize. No. But reification, I just was curious what you meant in terms of, you said reification of uh, beings, right? Uh, so I was just curious, because reification, what I understand, it's typically like the processes involved in the production of the commodity uh, disappear. So the, it presents itself as being... Uh, somewhat natural. Naturalization, Naturalization is a little different from reification, cool. but it's a, there's a big debate on reification, starting with Lukács, and the way I was just trying to use it yeah. here was the idea that that humans um, are are not only regarded as things, but in some sense get socially and historically established as things. Right? There's an ontological uh, change that happens. And this is a really important point, and it's something we're going to return to um, after the break, if you don't mind. Sure.